Hi again. I hope you all had a great lunch break. Uh, now we have with us Daniel, who has a very interesting talk on pattern matching in Python. He, I guess, is streaming from London. He has 20 years of professional background in technology with diverse roles like software engineering, project leader, and a trainer. And he loves Python, compilers, piano, and Dungeons and Dragons. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, is my audio working properly? Yes. OK, amazing. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. And hello from uh, surprisingly sunny London to everyone. And um, what I want to talk about today is uh, what I think is one of the most exciting features in Python coming up, which is structural pattern matching. My name is Daniel. I work as a trainer at, and training engineers at Bloomberg. And uh, something a bit more uh, relevant about me for this talk is that I'm one of the multiple authors of the pattern matching peps. Uh, it's not a single pep. It's a, it's a trilogy like Josh Lucas did. Well, at least it's not a trilogy of trilogies, but it's uh, three peps because it's, it's a big feature and, and important to describe it well and discuss it well. So uh, this is something that's not present in the latest Python release, which is or official Python release, which is 3.9. But if you download one of the Python 3.10 betas, uh, it's available. The implementation is ready. You can play with it and, and, and learn about it. So 3.10 will be available this October. And we will include pattern matching. So let's discuss what is pattern matching. And it's about uh, recognizing objects of different shapes. And if we look at the... Uh, at the background of this of these slides, uh, you can see that there are a lot of different shapes in this background, and we can recognize them by different aspects of them. We we could look at which of these shapes are black and which ones are white. We can say which ones are circles or which ones are crosses, or which one are big and and we only get this big uh, white X. So there are a lot of different things that you can look about uh, into a shape. So. Um, we're doing this not with uh, string, but with full objects. So what makes objects different? So what's the shape of an object is the first thing uh, we're trying to, to talk about. Um, the shape of an object, of a Python object, will be uh, related to its type. Uh, the, if it's a sequence, uh, how big it is. If it's a mapping, for example, a dictionary, uh, what keys are present in an object. And if it's any other instance, which attributes are present uh, also there. So these are all uh, different things that are present inside an object and that you can care about when describing its shape. Uh, also, you can check if the check for a specific object, like an exact value, like is this object the number three, or even um, combination and nesting of this, for example, is the attribute full of my instance the value exactly the value three? So the first impression you get from, from this description is that is, this is some sort of Boolean expressions uh, that will tell you yes or no given an object uh, to, to check if it matches a, a shape or not. But pattern matching goes beyond that. And that's one of the keys in, key insights uh, of, of, of this idea of pattern matching. Um, which is, why are we checking the shape of the objects? And when in your code you're checking the shape of an object, it's because you're about to do something on it that depends on the shape, and typically depends on extracting some data that where the extraction can only be done if the object has a certain shape. So for example, if you check that uh, the variable x holds a DAC object, it's probably because you want to do some DAC-specific operation on top of it. And if you are checking for the length of a sequence, it's because you probably want to extract some uh, indices from, from the sequence uh, before that length. If you check for the presence of, of a key or, a, or an attribute in a, in a mapping or in a general object, it's because you are about to access a key or access that attribute. So this is the, the most important thing. Checking that the notion matches the pattern and extracting data are normally very related operations and they're close to each other in your code. So can we do both of them uh, sort of at the same time? Can we describe, so our, our patterns want to, to describe not just the shape, but how to 
extract data from that. And, and the fun thing is that if we say, okay, we need to invent something about the composing an object and also assign the different components into variables. And Python, before pattern matching, already has something like that. So if you look at uh, tuple unpacking, um, or essentially sequence unpacking would be the proper name. Uh, for example, I can say, okay, given this sequence, I want to take the first element into A, the last element into C, and everything else into B with this description, A comma star B comma C. And this will disassemble my sequence. It will check that it has at least two elements and it will capture the proper elements in the proper variables. So pattern matching is cranking up this idea up to 11 and, and that's what we will do. And the first idea of, uh, the, the first point about how we design the syntax of patterns is following this example over here that Python already has. If you look at this, this is not actually building a list this is actually describing how to assemble a list, but it looks very similar to how you can build a list like this one, where you put A as the first element, C as the last, and all elements of B in the middle. So the object decomposition uses the same syntax as the, as the object creation. And when we are taking this idea further away, we will be doing uh, more of this. Uh, use our patterns will look like object creations, but it's important to recognize that our patterns will be used for the opposite operation from creation, which is decomposing the object into its component parts. So an, an easy way or intuitive way to, to, to see this is that uh, when you have a pattern, this on the left are patterns, uh, you have an object on the right, and we call the object being match the subject. We can say, okay, can this expression on the left uh, generate, given some values of the variables, uh, the value on the right. And in some cases, it's really true. Like, for example, this is, a, this, this is the same. A variable like x can generate anything because anything could be held into x. And that's actually the value that will be captured. So a pattern like this, x, y, will only generate lists or, or sequences of uh, two elements. And something like this uh, will only generate integral numbers, but never will generate a float. So these are the left are patterns that match these uh, corresponding subjects uh, when there's a tick here and don't match when there's a red X. So, and there are a lot of different patterns that are avail that will be available in Python 3.10. Um, let me, uh, I, I have this big table with all the examples and all the definitions. Uh, I, I just want to quickly go over the most prominent of these examples, so you don't need to read this whole slide. It's, there's a lot of information here. But essentially, you can check for a specific value, like these two examples of the top, or this middle example is even uh, pulling out the constant for a module, and you're, what you're checking is for equality. If you use a variable as a pattern, this actually always matches, but it will capture the value of the subject inside the, the, the variable that you chose. And you have a special case for the underscore variable, which uh, always matches but doesn't capture anything. So this is like a placeholder and will be useful in some cases that we'll see. We can also use like a, like a call to a class name to say, okay, this object is an instance of this given type because this looks like creating a dark object. But in this case, is our, we are checking if this can be created with this constructor. So we, we can do compositions of this. So for example, this is a sequence pattern, checking that I have a sequence of two elements and the first element matches this pattern and the second matches this one. So this will extract the second element into variable A. And we can do more complicated scenarios, combining the things above. You can also use patterns, not just on sequences, but also mappings, like dictionaries or default digs or other uh, Python mappings where you check for the presence of certain keys and check for the values to match certain patterns. And again, you can do extract nested extraction over there. So um, there are some patterns that don't look exactly like Python syntax because uh, we need to do things that were slightly different than what Python logic creation can do. For example, this vertical bar essentially means uh, any of the possible options over here. This is called an OR pattern because it's doing an OR between multiple possibilities. We have this ask uh, to essentially capture whatever is captured on the pattern on the left into a variable at the right. So this allows you to give variable names to more complicated things in, in, in patterns like this or expression between a Boolean or a yes or a string. And uh, you, you can even have uh, more 
complicated cases where you use a variable multiple times in, in all the different choices. So the, the syntax is quite powerful and extends a bit what normally Python can do. We also can see that we can match on uh, arbitrary objects based on their attributes. So this is checking that my object is a duck and the color of the duck should be green. This is checking that it's a duck, the color of the duck should be green, and it should have an H attribute, and I will capture the value of the H attribute into A. So this is essentially like doing all these checks and also uh, capturing this. So this is great in many cases because it's um, simplifying a lot of checks that you normally have to do before accessing some nested complicated attribute. And, and you can nest, nest even objects, for example. You can say, I want a duck, and the mother of that duck should be another duck, and I want to capture the age of the mother of the, of the duck, like that. And this does all the checks and pulls the attribute out of that. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of options. Uh, it's possibly uh, better if we look at some examples. But also, before doing that, uh, I mentioned what patterns are. But I still haven't explained how patterns fit into the language. Where, where can you use pattern? And patterns can only be used uh, in, in a single place, which is this new match case statement that has been added to the language, which normally looks like this. It has a match with a subject, and the subject is any Python expression, so a, a, a value or a variable or a function call or a list comprehension or whatever you want. And then you have multiple of these case blocks, each one containing some code and a pattern and an optional data, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. So you can think of this as a large if a leaf statement. So the goal of this statement is to choose a single block that will get executed. Only one block, one of these blocks at most will be executed. Uh, zero is also a possibility. For a block to execute, the pattern must match the subject. And if there's a Boolean condition over here, these Boolean conditions are useful when you want to express a more complicated condition that cannot be expressed with the pattern syntax. So you can add some extra uh, extra checks over here. So if the pattern of and the guard matches, this code block will be executed. And the case blocks are attempted top to bottom. So uh, there may be multiple pattern matching that, that will match patterns that will match the subject, but only the first one that matches will be the one that runs. Something also useful is that this guard can use the variables captured by the pattern. So this also tends to simplify how we can write expressions. Uh, um, let's, uh, let's look at some examples of all of this in action. So let me show you um, a slicer function that we are writing. Let's say that this is a spec that we've been given. This works similar uh, to the, um, uh, essentially the, um, the range function in function, the, the range function in Python, where you have a mandatory stop argument, but you can also provide a start and a step on the left and right. So if I want to slice this sequence until the stop point, I can pass only this argument beside the sequence. If I want to an interval and specify the start point, I can, I can pass two arguments. And if I want to specify the start, stop, and the interval, I pass the uh, three arguments. And, and that's what I should get. This is my specification. And uh, when you start writing that, you say, OK, I, th these arguments seem to be optional. But you cannot do this in Python, because you cannot put an optional argument before a mandatory argument. So this confuses uh, Python a bit because it doesn't support directly this case. And this is a, a syntax error. So this, this doesn't work. So let's see if we can use pattern matching for this. So what I want to do is essentially capture whatever arguments I get with these star args and match on that to consider all the different cases and possibilities. So if I have only a stop value, I return the sequence and the stop value. If I have a, a start and stop, I return the sequence slice with the start and stop. And if I if my star args is these three arguments, I return everything in a slice. And you also, you'll notice that this is not just checking that the length of the list is the proper length for each different scenario, but it's also capturing those variables, and these variables are being used on the right. So this is a good example of how I, I'm checking the shape and capturing data all at the same time, and how that, how that works. And I also have a final case with this magic underscore wildcard that I mentioned before that matches always 
where I'm writing an error if all of the cases above fail. Remember that cases are checked from top to bottom. So this ensures that uh, this is a very general case that always will match, but we will only execute this block if none of the cases above uh, happen. So if you look at the spec again, uh, you will see that this looks really, really similar to our spec. Uh, as Rusak Eckel, someone said, this is like executable pseudocode. So you can see that in this scenario, pattern matching allows us to capture our intent as, as developers and, and make very elegant and readable code, which is, which is something nice. So let's go into another example, which is the famous uh, FISPAS problem. It's a very uh, common child game and also uh, very frequently used in bad programming interviews where you want to go over the numbers from 1 to 100. And you say one, two, three, four, five, but instead of saying three, every time you hit a multiple of three, you say the word this. Every time you hit a multiple of five, you say the word bus. And every time you hit a multiple of both, you say this bus. So you'll say one, two, this, four, bus, this, uh, seven, et cetera. Um, so if we want to code that, there are infinite solutions to this problem, but let's look at the one with pattern matching. Essentially, I have different scenarios and each which scenario to, to choose depends on whether my number is divisible by three, and sorry, and whether my number is divisible by five. So I'm matching on this pair of Boolean values. So if both are true, it means it's divisible by both, so I print this first. If it's divisible by three, I print this. If it's divisible by five, I print bus and otherwise I print the number. So I'm again matching on a pair of values, it's matching on a tuple, which are Booleans in this case. And I'm again relying that the cases go from, uh, that the matching goes from top to bottom. And this is a very common way of using the match statement where you put more specific cases at the top and more general cases at the bottom. So I, I don't have to worry uh, about uh, this fees being printed if, um, the number is also multiple of five because that case was covered before. So let's do something more uh, interesting and more closer to, to real life. Let's say we're rendering uh, some template on, on a website and I'm getting some user information from the service and my template has to print a, a greeting for the, for the user. So I have some sort of user ID. I have this API call that gives me, gives me some JSON information about the user giving the ID, which is this response. And I want to uh, check what of the, of the possible responses that this service gives me are available. So I can get either an error or I can get the user. And also, let's say I have a special case where I want to make a special reading for the user if, the, if today is the birthday of that user. So let's say, okay, if I get some, uh, if my response is a JSON that has some error key inside of this, and this only checks that the error key is present, it doesn't care if, if I have another 20 keys, which is very common in APIs that I have a lot of keys that I don't care about, I will raise, for example, this sort of error. If I get a user with the name N and the date of birth uh, D, and also um, this is birth function, let's say, is telling me that uh, today is the birthday of a person born on date D, then I will print happy birthday. I will use the name that I capture here. So look that the name that I capture here, I'm using inside and the date that I capture, I'm using in the, in the guard over here. I'll print happy birthday to the user. In any other case, not know that this third case will match any user matched by the second case, uh, but uh, the second case will cover the birthday cases. So if it's not the birthday, I will fall back into this third case and we'll just print a generic welcome to the user. And if I get anything else from the API, probably uh, there's a bug in either the API code or my code. So I'm raising an exception and I telling that I get an unexpected response. Again, you can, we can see that cases go from specific, the one on the top to general, the one on the, on the bottom. So a very boring use for, um, a, a very boring uh, use case um, for pattern matching is a switch statement. A lot of people are saying, oh, Python now has a switch statement. Uh, uh, yes, you can use this as a switch statement and you can check, okay, is this, uh, let's say this HTTP status, is it 200? Is it a, an invalid user, a 403 code, a 301, which needs to be processed as redirect? 
Uh, but you can also combine them with uh, more complicated cases. So you can say, is, is the code something between 500 and 599? And then essentially caption, caption the code and using the guard and raising this error. And if it's something else, I raise an invalid status. And, and this works. And, and again, uh, in this case, I could look at this and say, I, am, am I getting anything out of uh, as compared to doing this with an if and a leaf statement? I'm probably not. So this case probably should be rethought as something that maybe made simpler. But in some cases, if you're saying that you could have more complicated logic and the response here, then pattern matching is a, is, is a great fit. So something else to be careful about is that I'm, I'm using literal constants and, and this match properly. If I use a variable name, let's say I have a constant which is called HTTP OK uh, with the value 200, and I write HTTP OK, this will actually look like a variable, so it will uh, always match. In that case, you still get some sort of syntax error because Python realizes that I'm matching the whole variable, uh, and I have cases after that which looks a bit funny, uh, so it stops me from uh, from doing that. But in many cases, especially if, if your last case is, is a constant name, but constants in variable and variables in Python are the same, you'll actually capture the capturing the value into the contents, which is probably not what you want. Python will try to help you most of the time here, but careful with this. So other, other use cases, if you look at PEP 636, there's an example of a simple parser for a, um, like a command line user interface where you type commands and, and, and there are parser. So, so very simple parsers where you pass list of strings and you want to check commands and arguments. It can be done with pattern matching. And going over complicated data structures, if you, if you follow this link, the, the slides will be online later, um, if you follow this link, you'll see an example of a red black tree. Red black trees are a, are, are a fancy balanced tree data structure where those are of two possible colors. And you need to maintain some invariance. We need to check that if the top node is red and, and the left child is black and, and the right uh, node has a nephew that does something. And all, all of these conditions can be very succinctly and clearly expressed in patterns. So you can see comparison of how much simpler the, the algorithm is with pattern matching. So going over recursive data structures is, is great with pattern matching. And um, so let's see how um, this, uh, this allows us to not, not just talk about the feature, but how this allows us to use, uh, to think about code in, in different ways. So we can think of pattern matching as a decomposition approach. And Python has some other decomposition approaches. For example, if I want to do a library to represent geometrical shapes, uh, we can use OOP. And in object oriented programming, I define a base shape class and a lot of subclasses, for example, a circle subclass that has an area method that knows how to compute the area for a circle. This is classical OOP, the lines on the bottom. But I can instead put the logic outside of my objects and say, well, okay, my, my objects will be dumb data structure, like Python data classes or name tuples or, or anything like that, or more complicated objects, it doesn't matter. And I have this area function that checks, checks the shape of my shape uh, here. And if it's a rectangle, it computes area for a rectangle, it computes area for a square or for a circle, or if it doesn't know how to compute area, it raises an exception. So in this case, um, putting the logic for a uh, all area computations in the same place, which has some benefits and, and drawbacks. And um, the the main point uh, the main pain point here is that uh, it allows me to focus on how I want to decompose things. You can say that okay, but in, in OP it's very easy to add a new shape because I, I just define a, a single class and all the logic is inside of here. Well, in, in, in the pattern matching approach, I have to add the shapes to all of these possible functions that uh, operate in shapes and the code is spread all over. And, and that is true, but I, I can give you a counter argument when I say, if I want to add new functionality rather than new shapes, new operations, in the object oriented approach, you need to spread new methods all about. Well, here, all of the logic is in, the, in a single place. So the emphasis is, uh, what do you what do we want to make extensible? Do we want to make it easy to add verbs to to our system or to add nouns to our systems? Where verbs are methods and nouns are objects. So this is the kind of same things as a method dispatch, but uh, focus on extensibility in a different place. 
So it's an alternative, not a substitute for OOP. And this comes from the functional programming paradigm where it's typical that we have uh, typical, uh, dumb values and smart functions is the way they, they call it. And essentially data structures don't, don't have any behavior and the functions have all the logics to uh, handle multiple cases. And, and, and this works very well when your uh, data doesn't change as often as the operations that you want to do on the data. For example, some sort of data analysis where every time you get new requirements on how to analyze uh, data, existing data that you have. In OOP, you can do this kind of same things with the visitor pattern, which is to so sort of solve this problem. But it's a bit cumbersome. You have to define a lot of auxiliary methods and auxiliary classes. Uh, pattern matching has a more straightforward syntax than the visitor pattern. And it also has additional power because the visitor pattern can only uh, split things apart based on their, um, based on their class. Well, pattern matching can check a lot of different things. So you could, for example, if you have an ellipsis shape, you can have a complicated formula for the area of ellipsis. But if you um, if you know that the that the foci of the ellipsis are in the same place, uh, then that's a circle, and you can use a circle formula instead. So I, I see some great questions that I, I will answer on the um, on the wonder app later on because I don't think we'll have time for questions within the talk. Um, so as comparison, how, how does this compare with um, the switch statement? And uh, so the checking is sequential. While some switch statements have these computed go-tos that could be uh, that, that are typically uh, faster because it's based on literals. Uh, I mean, a, a modern Python compiler in the future could do some optimizations if all, all of your values are constant, but no one is talking about doing that uh, anytime soon. And uh, also, uh, in, in a switch, you can use constant values, but you need to be careful with semantics, the problem I mentioned before. So again, it's not a great substitute for a switch statement. Uh, you can use it as that. Uh, it's not its main goal. So if you want to learn more about this, I recommend you to go in over the peps. The three peps cover different things. 634 is the specification. And so it's quite hard and technical, and it's for language implementers. 635 is interesting if you are wondering uh, why pattern matching is designed the way it is, or why should you use it, what are good use cases for this. So that's recommended in that case. And, and if you already love pattern matching and want to just learn how to use it, use it. 636 is a tutorial which guides you step by step through all of the syntax. And I have some link with some examples over here. I would also like to credit um, the people who made the Slice Carnival provided this awesome template. And all, uh, these are public. And uh, there are other pictures and photographs uh, which are used with permission from the creators. And thank you very much for uh, attending. Uh, this is my Twitter. It is very easy to reach me over here. And this is my email. I also try to answer anything that comes over pattern matching over here. But Twitter is probably the best way. So. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for attending. As, as a last point, uh, as I mentioned that I work from Bloomberg. Bloomberg is hiring. You can find this information about positions in this careers link. And also, we have a sponsor room in the conference systems, and you can jump around, and there's people. Uh, I, I'm around there, so if you want to talk to some engineers, we're around there. Um, and there's also people from HR if you want to talk about recruiting and hiring. So you're welcome to come. So if you, I'm going to jump out now, I think. Uh, but if you want to, if if you want to ask any questions, I'll be in the Wonder Me outside the Optiver room. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel.